The Botathen Ghost by Rev. S. R. Hawker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Botathen Ghost. The legend of Parson Rudol and the Botathen Ghost will be recognized by many Cornish people as a local remembrance of their boyhood. It appears from the diary of this learned master of the grammar school, for such was his office, as well as perpetual curate of the parish, that a pestilential disease did break forth in our town in the beginning of the year A.D. 1665. Yea, and it likewise invaded my school, insomuch that therewithal certain of the chief scholars sickened and died. Among others who yielded to the malign influence was Master John Elliot, the eldest son and the worshipful heir of Edward Elliot, Esquire of Tresbursey, a stripling of sixteen years of age, but of uncommon parts and hopeful ingenuity. At his own special motion and earnest desire, I did consent to preach his funeral sermon. It should be remembered here that, howsoever strange and singular it may sound to us, that a mere lad should formally solicit such a performance at the hands of his master, it was in consonance with the habitual usage of those times. The old services for the dead had been abolished by law, and in the stead of sacrament and ceremony, month's mind and year's mind, the sole substitute which survived was the general desire to partake, as they call it, of a posthumous discourse, replete with lofty eulogy and flattering remembrance of the living and the dead. The diary proceeds. I fulfilled my undertaking and preached over the coffin in the presence of a full assemblage of mourners and lachrymose friends, an ancient gentleman who was then and there in the church, a Mr. Bly of Botathen, was much affected by my discourse, and he was heard to repeat to himself certain parentheses therefrom, especially a phrase from Maro Virgilius, which I had applied to the deceased youth, et puer ipse fuit cantari dignus. The cause wherefore this old gentleman was thus moved by my applications was this. He had a firstborn, an only son, a child who, but a very few months before, had been not unworthy of the character I drew off young Master Elliot, who by some strange accident had of late quite fallen away from his parents' hopes and become moody and sullen and distraught. When the funeral obsequies were over, and I had no sooner come out of the church than I was accosted by this aged parent, and he besought me incontinently, with a singular energy, that I would resort with him forthwith to his abode at Botathen that very night. Nor could I have delivered myself from his importunity, had not Mr. Elliot urged his claim to enjoy my company at his own house. Hereupon I got loose, but not until I had pledged a fast assurance that I would pay him, faithfully, an early visit the next day. The place, as it was called, a Bothathen, where old Mr. Bly resided, was a low-roof, gabled manor-house of the fifteenth century, walled and mullioned, and with clustered chimneys of dark grey stone from the neighbouring quarries of Ventergan. The mansion was flanked by a pleasance or enclosure in one space of garden and lawn, and it was surrounded by a solemn grove of stag-horned trees. It had the sombre aspect of age and of solitude, and looked the very scene of strange and supernatural events. A legend might well belong to every gloomy glade around, and there must surely be a haunted room somewhere within its walls. Hither, according to his appointment on the morrow, Parson Rudolph betook himself, Another clergyman, as it appeared, had been invited to meet him, who, very soon after his arrival, proposed a walk together in the Plessons, on the pretext of showing him, as a stranger, the walks and trees, until the dinner bell should strike. There, with much prolixity, and with many a solemn pause, his brother minister proceeded to unfold the mystery. A singular infelicity, he declared, had befallen young Master Bly once the hopeful heir of his parents and the lands of Botathen, whereas he had been from childhood a blithe and merry boy. The gladness, like Isaac of old, of his father's age, 
he had suddenly of late become morose and silent, nay, even austere and stern, dwelling apart always solemn, often in tears. The lad had at first repulsed all questions as to the origin of this great change, but of late he had yielded to the importunate researches of his parents, and had disclosed the secret cause. It appeared that he resorted every day by a pathway across the fields to this very clergyman's house who had charge of his education, and grounded him in the studies suitable to his age. In the course of his daily walk he had to pass a certain heath or down where the road wound along through tall blocks of granite with open spaces of grassy sward between. There in a certain spot, and always in one and the same place, the lad declared that he had encountered every day a woman with a pale and troubled face, clothed in a long loose garment of frieze, with one hand always stretched forth, and the other pressed against her side. Her name, he said, was Dorothy Dinglet, for he had known her well from his childhood, and she often used to come to his parents' house. But that which troubled him was that she had now been dead three years, and he himself had been with the neighbours at her burial, so that, as the youth alleged with great simplicity, since he had seen her body laid in the grave, this that he saw every day must needs be her soul or ghost. Questioned again and again, said the clergyman, he never contradicts himself, but he relates the same and the simple tale as a thing that cannot be gainsaid. Indeed, the lad's observance is keen and calm for a boy of his age. The hair of the appearance, saith he, is not like anything alive, but it is so soft and light that it seemeth to melt away while you look. But her eyes are set, and never blink, no, not when the sun shineth full upon her face. She maketh no steps, but seemeth to swim along the top of the grass, and her hand which is stretched out all way, seemeth to point at something far away, out of sight. It is her continual coming for she never faileth to meet him, and to pass on that hath quenched his spirits, and although he never seeth her by night, yet cannot he get his natural rest. Thus far the clergyman. Whereupon the dinner clock did sound, and we went into the house. And after dinner, when young Master Bly had withdrawn with his tutor, under excuses of their books, the parents did forthwith beset me as to my thoughts about their son. Said I warily, the case is strange, but by no means impossible. It is one that I will study, and fear not to handle if the lad will be free with me and fulfil all that I desire. The mother was overjoyed, but I perceived that old Mr. Bly turned pale, and was downcast with some thought which, however, he did not express. Then they bade that Master Bly should be called to meet me in the pleasance forthwith. The boy came and he rears to me his tale with an open countenance, and withal a modesty of speech. Verily he seemed, ingenui vultus puer ingenuique pudoris. Then I signified to him my purpose. Tomorrow, said I, we will go together to the place, and if, as I doubt not, the woman shall appear, it will be for me to proceed according to knowledge and by rules laid down in my books. The unaltered scenery of the legend still survives and, like the field of the forty footsteps in another history, the place is still visited by those who take interest in the supernatural tales of old. The pathway leads along a moorland waste, where large masses of rock stand up here and there from the grassy turf, and clumps of heath and gorse weave their tapestry of golden-purple garniture on every side. Amidst all these, and winding along between the rocks, is a natural footway worn by the scant rare tread of the village traveller. Just midway, a somewhat larger stretch than usual of green sod expands, which is skirted by the path, and which is still identified as a legendary haunt of the phantom, by the name of Parson Rudolph's ghost. But we must draw the record of the first interview between the minister and Dorothy from his own words. We met, thus he writes, in Plessons very early, and before any others in the house were awake, and together the lad and myself proceeded towards the field. The youth was quite composed, and carried his Bible under his arm, from whence he read to me verses, which he said he had lately picked out, to have always in his mind. These were Job 7, verse 14. 
Thou scarest me with dreams, and terrifiest me through visions. And Deuteronomy 28, verse 67. In the morning thou shalt say, Would to God it were the evening. And in the evening thou shalt say, Would to God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. I was much pleased with the lad's ingenuity in these pious applications, but for mine own part I was somewhat anxious and out of cheer. For aught I knew this might be a demon meridianum, the most stubborn spirit to govern and guide that any man can meet, and the most perilous withal. We had hardly reached the accustomed spot when we both saw her at once gliding towards us. Punctually as the ancient writers describe the motion of their lemures, which swoon along the ground, neither marking the sand nor bending the herbage. The aspect of the woman was exactly that which had been related by the lad. There was the pale and stony face, the strange and misty hair, the eyes firm and fixed, that gazed, yet not on us, but something that they saw far, far away, one hand and arm stretched out, and the other grasping the girdle of her waist. She floated along the field like a sail upon a stream, and glided past the spot where we stood pausingly. But so deep was the awe that overcame me, as I stood there in the light of the day, face to face with a human soul separate from her bones and flesh, that my heart and purpose both failed me. I had resolved to speak to the spectre in the appointed form of words, but I did not. I stood like one amazed and speechless, until she had passed clean out of sight. One thing remarkable came to pass. A spaniel dog, the favourite of young Master Bly, had followed us, and lo, when the woman drew nigh, the poor creature began to yell and bark piteously, and ran backward and away like a thing dismayed and appalled. We returned to the house, and after I had said all that I could to pacify the lad and to soothe the aged people, I took my leave for that time, with a promise that when I had fulfilled a certain business elsewhere, which I then alleged, I would return and take orders to assuage these disturbances and their cause. January 7th, 1665. At my own house I find by my books what is expedient to be done, and then Agape, Satanas. January 9, 1665. This day I took leave of my wife and family, under pretext of engagements elsewhere, and made my secret journey to our diocesan city, wherein the good and venerable bishop then abode. January 10. Diogratius, in safe arrival at Exeter, craved and obtained immediate audience of his lordship, pleading it was for counsel and admonition on a weighty and pressing cause, called to the presence, made obeisance, and then by command stated my case, the Botathen perplexity, which I moved with strong and earnest instances and solemn asseverations of that which I had myself seen and heard. Demanded by his lordship, what was that succour that I might come to entreat at his hands? Replied, license for my exorcism, so that I might ministerially allay the spiritual visitant, and thus render to the living and the dead release from this surprise. But, said our bishop, on what authority do you allege that I am entrusted with faculty to do so? Our church, as is well known, hath abjured certain branches of our ancient power, on grounds of perversion and abuse. Nay, my lord, I humbly answered, under favour the seventy-second of the canons ratified and enjoined on us the clergy, Anno Domini 1604, doth expressly provide that no minister, unless he hath the license of his diocesan bishop, shall essay to exorcise a spirit, evil or good. Therefore it was, I did here mildly allege, that I did not presume to enter on such a work without lawful privilege under your lordship's hand and seal. Thereupon did our wise and learned bishop, sitting in his chair, condescend upon the theme at some length with some gracious interpretations from ancient writers and from holy scripture. And I did humbly rejoin and reply, till the upshot was that he did call in his secretary and command him to draw the aforesaid faculty, forthwith and without further delay, assigning him a form insomuch that the matter was incontinently done, and after I had dispersed into the secretary's hands certain monies for signatory purposes, as the manner of such officers hath always been, 
the bishop did himself affix a signature under the sigillum of his see and deliver the document into my hands when i knelt down to receive his benediction he softly said let it be secret mr r weak brethren weak brethren this interview with the bishop and the success with which he vanquished his lordship's scruples would seem to have confirmed parson rudolph very strongly in his own esteem and to have invested him with that courage which he evidently lacked at his first encounter with the ghost the entries proceed january eleventh sixteen sixty five therewithal did i hasten home and prepare my instruments and cast my figures for the onset of the next day took out my ring of brass and put it on the index finger of my right hand with the scutum davidis traced thereon january twelfth sixteen sixty five rode into the gateway at Bothathen, armed at all points, but not with Saul's armour, and ready. There is danger from the demons, but so there is in the surrounding air every day. At early morning, then, and alone, for so the usage ordains, I betook me towards the field. It was void, and I had thereby due time to prepare. First I paced and measured out my circle on the grass. Then did I mark my pentacle in the very midst and at the intersection of the five angles I did set up and fix my crutch of Rowan, Rowan. Lastly I took my station south, at the true line of the meridian, and stood facing due north. I waited and watched for a long time. At last there was a kind of trouble in the air, a soft and rippling sound, and all at once the shape appeared and came on towards me, gradually. I opened my parchment scroll and read aloud the command. She paused, and seemed to waver and doubt, stood still, and then I rehearsed a sentence sounding out every syllable like a chant. She drew near my ring, but halted at first outside, on the brink. I sounded again, and now at the third time I gave the signal in Syriac. The speech which is used, they say, where such ones dwell and converse in thoughts that glide. She was at last obedient and swam into the midst of the circle, and there stood still suddenly. I saw, moreover, that she drew back her pointing hand. All this while I do confess that my knees shook under me, and the drops of sweat ran down my flesh like rain. But now, although face to face with the spirit, my heart grew calm, and my mind was composed. I knew that the pentacle would govern her, and the ring must bind, until I gave the word. Then I called to mind the rule laid down of old, that no angel or fiend, no spirit, good or evil, will ever speak until they have been first spoken to. Nota bene. This is the great law of prayer. God himself will not yield reply until man hath made vocal entreaty once and again. So I went on to demand as the books advise, and the phantom made answer willingly. Questioned therefore not at rest, unquiet because of a certain sin, asked what and by whom, revealed it. But it is sub sigilo, and therefore nefas dictu mor anon inquired what sign she would give that she was a true spirit and not a false fiend stated before next yuletide a fearful pestilence would lay waste the land and myriads of souls would be loosened from their flesh until as she piteously said our valleys will be full asked again why she so terrified the lad replied it is the law we must seek a youth or a maiden of clean life and underage to receive messages and admonitions. We conversed with many more words, but it is not lawful for me to set them down. Pen and ink would degrade and defile the thoughts she uttered, and which my mind received that day. I broke the ring, and she paused, but to return once more next day. At evensong, a long discourse with that ancient transgressor, Mr. B., great horror and remorse, entire atonement and penance, whatsoever I enjoin, full acknowledgment before pardon. January 13, 1665 At sunrise I was again in the field. She came in at once, and as it seemed, with freedom, inquired if she knew my thoughts and what I was going to relate, answered, Nay, 
We only know what we perceive and hear. We cannot see the heart. Then I rehearsed the penitent words of the man she had come up to denounce, and the satisfaction he would perform. Then said she, Peace in our midst. I went through the proper forms of dismissal, and fulfilled all as it was set down and written in my memoranda. And then, with certain fixed rites, I did dismiss that troubled ghost, until she peacefully withdrew, gliding towards the west. Neither did she ever afterward appear, but was allayed until she shall come in her second flesh to the valley of Armageddon on the last day. These quaint and curious details from the diurnal of a simple-hearted clergyman of the seventeenth century appear to betoken his personal persuasion of the truth of what he saw and said, although the statements are strongly tinged with what some may term the superstition, and others the excessive belief of those times. It is a singular fact, however, that the canon which authorizes exorcism under episcopal license is still a part of the ecclesiastical law of the Anglican Church, although it might have a singular effect on the nerves of certain of our bishops if their clergy were to resort to them for the faculty which Parson Rudol obtained. The general facts stated in his diary are to this day matters of belief in that neighborhood and it has been always accounted a strong proof of the veracity of the parson and the ghost, that the plague, fatal to so many thousands, did break out in London at the close of that very year. We may well excuse a triumphant entry on a subsequent page of the diurnal with the date of July 10, 1665. How sorely must the infidels and heretics of this generation be dismayed when they know that this black death which is now swallowing its thousands in the streets of the great city, was foretold six months agone, under the exorcisms of a country minister by a visible and suppliant ghost. And what pleasures and improvements do such deny themselves, who scorn and avoid all opportunity of intercourse with souls separate, and the spirits, glad and sorrowful, which inhabit the unseen world. End of The Botathen Ghost Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.